So as, uh, as was indicated, I'm going to say a little bit about uh, explainability, novelty, and intent. And, and you know, much of what I'm going to talk about sort of bridges uh, aspects of human learning and aspects of machine learning. Um, because I think many of the challenges of AI going forward um, deeply involve better understanding people um, and the kinds of things people are going to do with the information and, uh, and algorithms that they have access to. Um, <clears throat> all right, so the, the broader goal is that I'm going to highlight three challenges for applications of AI in society and argue uh, that while certainly answers are possible, um, you can always come up with answers, um, getting good and satisfying answers is, is a tricky long-term problem um, that we might want to care about from, from both from the behavioral sciences, from the computer sciences, and also from, from legal uh, perspectives as well. Um, and I think failure to address these challenges um, would, would constitute uh, vulnerabilities for society um, uh, to uh, bad actors for sure, but also just uh, large scale bad outcomes. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about uh, these three challenges, explainability, novelty, and intent um, in the context of uh, uh, existing uh, machine learning and AI tools. Um, and I mean, most of the talk, I should say, is going to be relatively informal. Um, I'll, I'll highlight a little bit of uh, the math and technical background, but probably not go into much detail at all. Um, but um, I'll refer you to papers and things where you can get all of the fun technical details. Um, so the first topic of explainability is uh, come to the fore in part because of the success of uh, uh, deep neural networks um, and in, uh, in doing prediction tasks, but also because um, it's very unclear uh, why they succeed when they do, right? They're opaque classes of models. And I think there's general consensus that that is a reasonable interpretation of, of what is going on. Um, that is, they, they qualify as opaque. So just to give some motivating examples, um, Classic work over here on the left. Um, can you see my cursor? So, yeah, circling it around. Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> show some uh, uh, examples of adversarial images. So in the first column and the third column here, um, in between there were some random pixels added. And what those did is shift the classification of that image. So in the bottom case, it's you know a dog down here, but it's now no longer classified as a dog, um, even though the changes are imperceptible to a human. Um, another fun example is uh, shown on the right um, uh, in which we get uh, somewhat crazy looking examples from uh, familiar categories. So the one my cursor's over right now is uh, was recognized by a neural network as a king penguin. Um, and on the far right here, an electric guitar. And clearly they bear no, no meaningful resemblance um, to those uh, images. And so even though they do quite well on uh, training sets um, and test sets, um, they, they seem to be doing well based on things that we, that don't, aren't human intuitive at least. Um, and so this is concerning because um, one can uh, create examples uh, that sort of uh, highlight the the fact that if we were to use this in in um, in society, there might be uh, serious consequences. So here on the top right, we have an image of uh, what is clearly a turtle, um, but a neural network has been convinced that it's a rifle. Um, this comes from the DARPA explainable AI program's motivations, right? So clearly, um, uh, this this kind of uh, um, error is not just a category error, it's actually an error in sort of uh, uh, real world consequences and the kinds of reactions we might wanna draw. And um, <clears throat> in addition to sort of all of these examples, which include mostly artificial manipulations, there are natural instances of adversarial examples. So that in this case, we have a bullfrog in, in a grassy field and it's reliably categorized as a, as a, a fox squirrel. Um, and again, you know, all of these are, are concerning. And this is not to uh, take away from the fact that neural networks um, do uh, have some amazing performance, but that 
you know, there's something more going on here that I think, you know, if, if we were to want to use this in society, we want to be able to audit the, uh, the behavior both before and after um, uh, decisions are made. Um, and so that, that's the motivation for explainability. We want to be able to, you know, hook up something to um, existing models that perform uh, very, very well in, in some contexts, um, such that we would be able to get uh, a human intuitive under, understanding for, um, for uh, why they did what they did, um, maybe after the fact or in a priori um, predict, get a sense of what kinds of things they're going to predict and when they're going to be reliable and when they're not. Um, and so, you know, one big question that we might have is, well, what, what counts as an explanation? Um, uh, clearly, if we want to have explainable AI, we've used the word, what is an explanation? Well, there's a huge philosophical literature um, tangling with this question. We're going to immediately jettison that, um, not because it's not important, uh, it is. Uh, but in general, when people say explainable AI, um, what they're hoping for is something that works. Um, <clears throat> and, and, uh, and the philosophical questions are actually quite hard and deep and have you know, hundreds of years of work behind them. Um, but still, we have a, a hard problem. Well, what, is it, what counts as uh, an explanation or explainable model? Um, and in, there are three sort of general classes of uh, uh, um, explanations or, or things that we might think of as explanations. The first on the right here is um, thinking about a particular kind of representation. Um, and so uh, this is an image of uh, Rich Karana, um, who's a, a researcher at Microsoft who's argued for linear models as explainable models, right? And among other things, um, and he's been an articulate defender of that kind of idea. And the idea there is just to take simpler models, um, models that people can understand. Um, and I think one can ask whether that actually works. Um, certainly if one is taught statistics, you might know that um, it actually takes people a long time to understand such models. Um, but uh, <clears throat> you know, this is a sort of hard question. So at, at the second level, we might ask, well, maybe, maybe it's not really about the representation. If we really want these deep neural networks, the representations are complicated. We don't want to simplify them. Maybe it's good enough to be able to predict what the AI algorithm is going to do either before the fact. Um, so before you see a label, if you can get, say, examples, um, if they help you predict what the AI is going to do, then that's good enough. That's a, that's, that counts as an explanation. And you might think of that as a sort of functional type explanation. A third deeper uh, level uh, picture at the bottom is some, some notion of understanding. Um, uh, and so we might think of this as like a causal or mechanistic um, type of understanding, getting closer to sort of the ways philosophers think about uh, explanations. Um, but this is, uh, this is also going to be challenging in part because, you know, the, the kinds of models that we're dealing with don't obviously admit that in, in any transparent way. Um, uh, and so, you know, these, these are three different types of uh, arguments that have been made. Um, and, and I think, you know, they are, they're all interesting and, and have potential roles. But, but one key thing, I think, for all of them, and I've sort of hinted at this in the case of representation, is that it's really not an explanation until you've shown that a person understands it. The, the purpose of explainable AI is to explain predictions to a person. Um, and, and this is actually a flaw in much of the computer science literature and machine learning literature on explainable AI is that there are often not even human experiments um, demonstrating uh, that, it, that it actually works. Um, and so this is one of the things that we've been working on for quite a long time, mainly focusing on this prediction kind of problem. Um, and, and I'll give you a, a flavor for what it looks like, and we'll get to see some of the challenges. Um, and so it, it comes down to sort of what, what counts as a good explanation in any of these contexts. And we'll pick on the prediction case. So here, imagine you're in, a, in, a, in an experiment um, where you get this image, right? And you need to say, well, is, is the AI going to say it's a flagpole or a barn, right? So it's not about what is actually in the picture. It's what you think the, the model is going to do. Um, and you might do this without any information, in which case you'd be blindly guessing. Um, 
you might get, say, some examples or something, um, some kind of explanation. In this case, the top row gives you examples from the category flagpole and examples from the category barn that are meant to sort of give you a sense for what the AI is doing. Um, you might alternatively or in conjunction also get some kind of uh, what's often called a salience map. Um, so here we're using uh, blurring um, or really sharpening to highlight the pixels that are influencing um, the AI. Um, in each of these cases. So you can see that for the um, for the barn flagpole, there's a little uh, patch sort of up in the middle of that uh, windmill. And there's a patch at the front of the barn um, that are that are especially influenced influential pixels for the AI. And what we want to know is, do these explanations work? Which ones or in which combination, right? Do they actually help a person predict what the AI is going to do? Um, <clears throat> and so what we've been doing is, uh, in my lab is conducting experiments to try to understand this kind of phenomenon. Um, and you're going to need some, some details, like how do you generate an explanation? So the approach that we've been using is what's called what we call Bayesian teaching. Um, and it's formalized down here. You can see that the probability of uh, teaching, uh, with a particular example, given a hypothesis here represented by theta is gonna be related to the probability of the learner inferring uh, the parameter after seeing the example, um, a prior on the examples themselves, and then a normalizing constant in the denominator. For those familiar with Bayesian inference, it looks a lot like Bayesian inference with the variables swapped. Um, and that's the basic idea here, or choice theory, if you prefer that. Um, and this is a, a model that comes from the literature on uh, human cognition and human learning. Um, uh, and, and capture some phenomena that we think might actually support explanation, right? The uh, use of examples um, uh, and so on. Um, <clears throat> and so we, we adapt uh, this model to be able to teach neural networks, in this case, ResNet, um, which is a classic machine learning model for classification of images. Um, and we're gonna test it on uh, ImageNet. Um, and so we're going to look at a, a broad variety of categories. We're going to carefully select them. I'm going to go gla glaze over many of the details. But one of the things that these categories vary on are um, whether they're familiar to people. Um, so in the case of barn versus flagpole, those are familiar categories. Um, in, there are also categories in ImageNet that are quite unfamiliar to many people. So specialized breeds of dogs, for example, um, uh, obscure species of spiders, and so on. Um, and so that's one of the, the variables that isn't included in the model that ImageNet doesn't pay attention to, but might matter for humans. Um, <clears throat> and so here I'm going to show you some, some aggregated performance. Um, we'll look at this first column. Uh, this first uh, uh, bar represents what people guess at baseline. And you can see that it's right about 50%, um, uh, slightly above, uh, because I, well, there's some details. but. Um, here in the second column, we have no examples, but we included the salience map on that target image, that barn in the example. Um, so that's all they got to see. And then they had to predict wh whether it was going to say barn or flagpole. In this case, you get examples, but no uh, salience map. And in this case, you get both examples and salience maps. And what we see is that you know we pick these, these categories and these examples to be hard so that there's actually a signal. Um, and what we find is that, um, on average, um, we can get people to uh, predict uh, uh, the AI's behavior about, on average, about 13% better. Um, and the max, the best performing individual, is about 20% better than uh, with explanations versus without. Um, <clears throat> and and so. You know, there's a, there's a substantial signal, um, but it's clearly not at ceiling performance. Um, and one of the interesting phenomena is if we break things out by familiar categories and unfamiliar categories, we see different signatures um, of the model. In particular, um, the uh, salience maps um, tend to improve specificity. So the cases where the model is getting it wrong um, substantially. Um, but the examples do better for the familiar trials, um, whereas the examples do better for the unfamiliar trials. And 
And so this is sort of intuitive, I think, that you know, examples matter more if you're unfamiliar with the category itself. Um, but it's a phenomenon that I think would not have been predicted um, uh, ahead of time and suggests that different explanations matter in different circumstances based on people's knowledge about the world. Um, and so if you want explanations, there are all these interesting details that come up um, when you start thinking about the fact that you have to actually explain two people. Um, among other things, we're able to show that there's a 20% uh, percent bump in uh, more than 20% bump in specificity um, for these natural adversarial images as well. So there's really, there's a really substantial signal, but what you'll note is that this is still well below 100%, right? Um, um, <clears throat> and so one of the, the questions that I think comes up is how good is good enough, right? I mean, if you wanna have explanations, what, what constitutes a satisfying explanation? Do we just de facto declare that if you have a particular representation, that's fine? Um, I think that's not fine um, uh, because you haven't explained it to anyone. But if you start going down the road of behavioral experiments, there are interesting and deep questions about humans and how, how to explain two different people um, uh, the same uh, problems. Um, and, and moreover, there, there are questions about what, what methods are sort of standard or reasonable if we want to use these, uh, use behavioral results as criteria. Um, and, and this is, I think, also a kind of complicated and subtle problem, right? It depends exactly how you formalize the problem um, and what, uh, uh, and that might want, you might want that to be informed by how people are using these tools. Um, and so there's sort of lots of nuance here that's, I think, hard and interesting once you start thinking about the human perspective on this. Um, and so we might ask, well, can, can we enforce uh, that explanations uh, be used? And, and certainly that can be done. That's been done for quite a long time. Um, so the European Union, for example, um, has recently passed a right to explanation for algorithmic decisions. Um, and then the question is, well, you know, how are we going to have standards that that are meaningful and useful? Um, and I think we can probably draw information from things like clinical trials here, um, which is a case where um, certain kinds of, uh, uh, of course, if you want to introduce a drug, you have to test it. Um, and of course, these kinds of scientific uh, clinical trials um, have standards that have been used in the past. And so we might think about how we could uh, bring some knowledge to bear from from those uh, from, from that domain. There are more radical uh, conclusions that one could uh, adopt if, if you were going to um, go down the road of picking particular representations, then you might ban opaque mo models. Um, I think this is a, a sort of interesting proposal. I think it's a non-starter probably because the whole point is that we want accuracy. Um, otherwise, there's no, nothing to explain. Um, and the most accurate models right now are the opaque ones. Um, and a final one, which I think is uh, particularly interesting, is thinking about whether it makes sense to try to uh, restrict two classes of theoretically uh, provable explainable models. Um, and so uh, while this may seem uh, a far stretch because it's proving something about humans and machines interacting, um, I think there's actually some, some reason to believe that this is uh, an interesting direction and I'll hint at, at why um, in, in later slides. Um, so there aren't a lot of uh, easy answers here. There are a lot of decisions that need to be made. We could get an answer, um, of course, um, but we would need to define things like, well, what constitutes opaque models? Um, what, uh, under what circumstances do we require explainability if it is opaque or for all models? Um, and, and you know, what constitutes a standard for explanation? What is satisfying enough? And I showed you some, some results that I think are interesting and promising that show how hard the problem actually is, right? We've been working on this for a couple of years now. Um, and, you know, we're uh, topping out at about, you know, max difference in performance of about 20% um, on a scale of, of course, 50 to, to 100. So there's a long way to go um, uh, in terms of explanations and, and getting good explanations. Um, <clears throat> so that's one challenge. Um, the second challenge that I think is interesting is, is the problem of novelty, right? And this, um, I 
hinges on the fact that you know when we train models, we we set up closed world uh, training sets. Um, but of course, if we're going to use them out in the in the wide world, um, it's an open world problem, right? Anything could happen. Um, so if you train a classifier on ten classes of categories, there is of course an eleventh class um, and and more. Um, and we might want our um, models to have well-defined behavior in those kinds of contexts, right? How do we generalize out from the specific training set that we have to the much broader problem um, where we can't control what the data are that are coming in? Um, <clears throat> and so the, the core idea is that guarantees um, associated with machine learning typically only apply with uh, sufficiently similar test sets. Usually you assume that the test set is a ran, uh, test and training or random samples from some larger population, um, which isn't gonna be true in general um, because the world is big and open, but also because we have motivated adversaries in, in some contexts um, who uh, will adapt to the, the automation that is deployed. Um, and again, one might ask, is there information that we can draw from other fields here, say engineering or medicine? And I think um, engineering is actually a reasonable candidate in this kind of context. Um, again, though, there are, there are questions about, you know, what, what constitutes novelty? So I sort of hinted at one example, but um, suppose we train on cats and dogs and mugs and hats. Um, now, what kinds of novelty do we care about? Do we care about novelty at the level of pixels? Um, in which case you're thinking of things like single pixel attacks on, um, on classifiers perhaps, um, or you know, small subsets of pixels, um, features. Maybe we want to think about novelty at the level of new instances of a class. In general, for machine learning, what we hope is that they generalize to new instances of a class, right? So if you have trained on a bunch of cats, you get a new picture of a cat, hopefully it does okay. Um, uh, so, so that's actually a, a novelty that we don't want to be treated as totally novel, um, oftentimes. Um, the example I gave before was the example of having a novel class. So instead of just having cats and dogs and mugs and hats, we might have giraffes now. And then does your model know that it's encountering something new or not? Um, and then you can think about more complicated things like uh, relations. So suppose we've been trained on cats um, and we've been trained on bicycles, but now you see a cat riding a bicycle. Um, do we want to count this kind of thing as a novelty also? Um, and so there, there, there's a big question, a hard question about what counts as a novelty um, uh, that requires defining much in the same way I think that explanation requires um, uh, some, some concrete oper operationalization. Um, <clears throat> and so sort of the, the minimum criterion I think we would want here is that, you know, we have an AI that monitors its own uncertainty, right? So it, in particular cases, um, if uh, it's unsure what class to assign, it doesn't assign or says, you know, we should not work with it. Um, and this is the detection problem. So we detect some kind of novelty. Um, and, and what obviously what I'm hinting at here is some kind of um, maintenance of uncertainty or inferences about uncertainty. So probabilistic models would be one candidate or any mo model that really has a probabilistic interpretation, which um, spans a, a fairly broad class of models these days. Um, and so, you know, one, one direction uh, for, for novelty detection, um, at least, is, is just calibrating and maintaining uh, uncertainty um, uh, in the model itself. Um, <clears throat> there are also, uh, it's worth keeping in mind that there are classes of models that include novelty, so uh, Bayesian nonparametrics being a fun example, um, but they're not state of the art on many tasks. And so one thing that we might care about is extending all of our models toward this more open world type problem where um, we don't rely on the training set um, being uh, defining a fixed and, and sort of finite world for our model. Um, but we more take more authentically the problem of openness um, and the fact that new things will happen. 
And then the third, I think, um, uh, direction or, or problem is to sort of sy systematically study types of novelty and how they how they influence and affect our models. Um, and so, as I mentioned, there's this sort of different levels of analysis of novelty and 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 where you know we may or may not care about all of them um, for any given model. And so we might want to carefully think about well, what what really what are we hoping for our models to, to do and to sort of protect against in, in the case of novel novelty? Um, and so novelty is, um, I think, a, an interesting problem also without easy answers in part because we don't really know what novelty is. Like we have an intuitive sense, but you know, defining it fairly concretely um, is gonna be a hard problem. Um, uh, detection, of course, enforcing that models have some mechanism, I think, is a, a problem that we could uh, enforce fairly straightforwardly. Um, but ensuring that performance is good is, is a much harder problem, right? Because it actually it involves having a reasonable model of the, the whole world or the openness of the world. Um, and that is, I think, trickier than, than it looks at first, if only because there are um, uh, adversarial kinds of situations that may arise that actually attempt to exploit models. <clears throat> the final um, challenge uh, that I'll talk about is, is intent. Um, and in particular, this, this arises because um, the people that build uh, models are often not the people that are using the models, um, or at least there's a, a huge asymmetry between um, the builders and the users. Um, and, and I think this uh, has implications, well, has strong implications for society. Um, and so I think it goes without saying at this point that there's um, fairly obviously mis misaligned incentives for um, large companies. Um, so in, in the case of companies like Amazon, their incentive is to get you to buy things and, and you know, that's not always your incentive. Um, uh, and sometimes you might just want to learn about things or whatever. Um, but in that case, it feels um, less, uh, maybe, maybe inoffensive. We expect this out of companies, right? That they are uh, optimizing to make money. Um, and, and it's annoying when it recommends more tents after you bought your tent, but uh, it's not necessarily a deep and abiding problem for society. If we instead think about things like Facebook and YouTube, um, where, the people, the users are the customers. Um, the, the idea of uh, creating algorithms that optimize human behavior in particular directions um, becomes all the more uh, concerning, I think. Right? And, and lots of these examples have, have been drawn up. So Facebook's use of the like button is one where they sort of passed along news that was well liked. It turns out people weren't pressing the button because they liked things necessarily um, and, and passing on news that people like made everyone less happy um, and so on. Um, and, and so this, you know, this arises in part because they're optimizing for engagement, which is not necessarily um, going to optimize your, um, your happiness. Uh, YouTube's another example. Um, <clears throat> YouTube's another example where um, uh, optimizing for engagement has, uh, has led to, uh, I think, demonstrably bad outcomes uh, where it, it tends to radicalize uh, people because you know, YouTube makes their money from you watching commercials. So it's in their, their interest to get you to sit there, uh, mouth agape, watching things. Um, but that's not your interest, right? Um, that's not society's interest in general. And, and so I think you know, the, this issue of misaligned incentives is, is a big one um, and is one that I think is, is largely overlooked um, in, in much of the uh, machine learning literature. Um, and so <clears throat> what I'd like to raise is the possibility that loss functions or just choice of what you're optimizing um, is an expression of intent, right? It's, it's the goal of the company to you know, in YouTube's case, to keep your eyes on that screen. Um, and, and so, you know, predictive accuracy is not a good universal goal, right? It's not the only good universal goal. Predicting that effectively doesn't necessarily help people in general. 
um, and explainability and novelty give other examples where there, I think there are other um, goals that we might want to integrate. Um, and so, <clears throat> and so what, are, what are the choices? What, where might we be going um, that would substitute in something, right? Um, just simply predicting what the company wants is maybe not, not ideal. Um, so I'll uh, briefly go through a, a slight elaboration of the, the prior model that I um, uh, described. Um, that, I, that is our, based on our recent work, the uh, formalizing um, cooperative communication. And so this is a case where we actually formalize a model that's not about predictive accuracy in the usual sense of missing, missing values, but instead um, the prediction problem or the problem being optimized is that the, the algorithm can communicate successfully with you or vice versa. You can communicate with it by way of data. Um, and so, uh, here, I'll, uh, we formalize this model in, in two pieces, right? There's a learner model where uh, it's straightforward Bayesian inference. We have the probability of hypotheses given data. It's going to be related to a likelihood times a prior with a normalizing constant in the denominator, straight ahead Bayesian inference, with one modification, um, which is that the algorithm doing the selecting is uh, another agent. So we're formalizing agent choice um, in this probability of a teacher selecting data, where that's defined on the right-hand side here. So the probability of a teacher choosing data given a hypothesis is going to be related to the learner's uh, probability of inferring that hypothesis after seeing the data, the prior on the teacher's prior on the data, and then a normalizing constant over here. And so you can see that these models are intertwined. You have two agents mutually reasoning about each other. Um, and so we're substituting in a different kind of optimization problem. We're not trying to predict um, missing values out in the world accurately. We're, we're optimizing the process of taking a hypothesis, putting in data and sending it to um, uh, another person where we both are uh, win when we understand each other. Um, and so you can solve this with a fixed point iteration. Um, and this is a model that has been used extensively um, and has a bunch of relatives in, in the behavioral science literature. So it's closely related to um, the a Rational Speech Act model in, in language, for example. Um, and so what we've shown recently is that there's a, a strong mathematical foundation for this model. So I described the algorithmic story of probabilistic interacting agents. Um, and what we've shown in the paper cited below is that this is uh, the fixed point of this is also the solution to entropy regularized optimal transport. Um, and, and this is, I think, neat for a variety of reasons. Um, one is it allows us to sort of analyze systematically all of these models. The connection between the two is synchron scaling, which is a way of solving for entropy regularized optimal transport um, plans. Um, and we can take advantage of uh, a variety of the mathematical properties of, uh, of the uh, EOT and, and Synchorn to sort of prove certain phenomena about interactions between agents. So for example, because Synchorn is a continuous function, you can uh, make arguments about uh, what happens under violations of common ground, in particular that bounded uh, differences at the beginning are bounded at the end. Um, and so you know, this is very early work in many ways. I, we're presenting it in a, a month um, at NeurIPS. Um, but what I think it suggests is that, and you know, there are many other papers going down a similar avenue uh, these days, um, is that there are a class of models that I think expand out the way we think about machine learning to actually think about um, interactions between agents. And that class of models is important. Um, and it should be playing a bigger role in, in the kinds of things that we use in society. Um, because you know, the output of machine learning model is input to something, um, often, an, often a person. And so this is an example where we, uh, I assumed at the beginning without sort of giving you too many details that we know the goal that, that we're sharing, right? Which is that we wanna uh, you know, agree on the hypothesis at the end. Um, it's a small step to generalize that to uh, think about uh, more cooperative, uh, more general cooperative situations. But what we might want from algorithms uh, that are deployed is something even stronger, which is that they actually try to infer what your goal is and help you achieve it, right? And so instead of optimizing you, 
they're optimized to help you. Um, and I think that swap is a potentially important one um, and, and one that I think uh, is worthy of, of broader discussion. That said, it is also a very, very hard problem. Um, it's state of the art in, in human learning, it's state of the art in machine learning. Um, and so there are big open uh, questions on both fronts there, um, but I think there's some reason to be hopeful that we can uh, develop mathematical frameworks to, to think about these things and not think about them just as algorithms anymore. So we might be able to prove certain properties about classes of models um, that um, would uh, be desirable. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, what I'd like to argue for um, in this part is that, you know, there aren't easy answers, um, not because we don't know, I, I don't, I, not because we don't know what we want, um, but because what we want is sort of right over the horizon on multiple fronts. Um, but I think, you know, it's worth considering um, and, and uh, a sustained discussion of, of what we want algorithms to do in society. In particular, do we want algorithms that optimize people? period. Um, uh, and, and we might want some nuance there, right? So marketing has been around for a long time. And you could argue that is about optimizing people. Um, and it would be hard to, you know, outlaw that for sure. But um, I think in these cases where people are the product, so to speak, um, in, in the cases of Facebook and YouTube and so on, um, there might be a compelling argument that uh, uh, that we need to consider different different standards for um, for what the machine learning tools are um, that are being deployed. Okay, so again, to summarize, uh, I wanted to sketch out cha three challenges for applications of AI in society. Right, explainability, novelty, and intent. I think they're all interesting. I think they're all potentially hard. We might make progress in all of them uh, in in the near term, but sort of you know, really uh, satisfying answers might be quite challenging in every case. Um, and, and certainly, I think, you know, each of these represent vulnerabilities for society. Explainability, because if we can't do this, um, we have a choice, right? We can either not use these models in certain contexts. So for example, they're not used in the military right now, because there are legal uh, consequences of signing off on algorithms in the field. Um, uh, so they just don't use them. And so, you know, that has consequences for recognizing certain things potentially, right? So uh, just performance of classifiers. Um, on the flip side, we can deploy them and just, you know, hope for the best. Um, so, so I think either side of the explainability challenge is, um, uh, you know, either choice that we have at the moment is, is not great. And so I think there's a strong incentive to uh, get to a reasonable and satisfying solution for that. Novelty, I think, is the same sort of problem, right? If we're going to send out algorithms in the world, um, we absolutely have to, I think, have them have some kind of guarantees for the kinds of uh, scenarios that they will encounter. Um, and in particular, some guarantees related to novel uh, circumstances and, and uh, an appropriate decision making around what happens when novel situations are encountered. And then the third being, um, you know, the deployment of algorithms by by companies that optimize us directly, um, and thinking about that in, uh, asymmetry of intent and the sort of uh, asymmetries of uh, uh, of power and and numbers, um, uh, I think, call for um, some some serious consideration of. Uh, uh, rules about what kinds of algorithms are deployed in such situations. All right, and so, you know, much of this work is informed by uh, uh, grants and things that I've been working on. Um, in particular, each of these sections comes from uh, recent uh, DARPA programs that are focused on explainable AI, um, novelty, and, and human machine teaming. Um, and so I think this just underscores the, the importance of, of getting ahead of these problems um, from, from legal and, and societal perspectives. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, that, was, that was fascinating. Um, 
Uh, so I, uh, again, have the pleasure of being the question asker. So if people want to drop questions in the, either in the chat or in the q and I'll see either of them. Um, and, but until then, I have uh, a question or two. So on the, on the, um, on the, you, you said that instead of optimizing you, we might hope that uh, uh, we build models to optimize, to help you, to figure out what you're trying to do and optimize to help you. So I wonder, my, I guess my question is, is, are there settings in which that's what's already happening? So could I think of search um, as an example of that? Or would you say that even search or maybe like, I don't know, music playlists, my Spotify weekly playlist, um, those sort of feel like something along the lines of helping me, but maybe I'm just too, you know, mm. too subordinated by the powers that be. Yeah, I mean, I think I think they differ kind of in, in important ways. So I think you're right that like recommendation um, in particular, uh, in, in particular, the explore um, exploit dilemma in recommendation systems, which is a big issue that people are interested in, um, sort of gets at uh, is is an example of attempting to sort of help, right? Because it's balancing two things: one is recommending you things that you like, and the other is learning about what you, what it is you like. Mm -hmm. right? um, and so you, you might think of that as a sort of nascent form of of the uh, kind of uh, uh, helpful cooperation. Um, hmm. You might also think that, well, you know, that's probably not as far as you would like, right? So like typically models often think about um, uh, the true answer as being fixed and static, whereas, you know, we're learning. Um, and so helping you learn about what you like might, might right. also be a next layer. Um, and I don't know that there are many models doing that, but yeah. Um, search, I think is, is somewhat different, right? It, um, it sort of has a, a general purpose kind of feel to it, but it's easy to see that it's not all that helpful in some cases, right? It doesn't share your goals in the sense that it doesn't adapt to anything meaningful about what you're trying to do. So for example, if you go to Wikipedia to learn about cats, reliably in 10 minutes, you'll be somewhere learning about uh, Aboriginal people of uh, Australia or whatever, right? I mean, like, sure, but is that the search's fault or is that the is that Wikipedia's fault? Uh, I mean, I think you know that's that's a reasonable question. Like, where's the agency here, right? Like, regardless, right. it isn't helping us get to what we want, maybe, <laughs> or at least, you know, maybe we need help getting to what we want. Uh, um, um, but, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, so there is a question in the chat. Uh, uh, so Sabrina asks, how will it be mandated that companies follow algorithms that aren't trying to go after the user? For example, YouTube trying to keep users watching. Uh, won't companies just keep doing what is most profitable for them? So I think the question is about like, how do we, how do we mandate uh, the thing, the solutions, even if we knew what the solutions were? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm not a lawyer, so, you know, I'll, uh, I'll punt largely on this, but, you know, uh, there's a reason why I sort of invoked loss functions and, and prediction, right? Because, like, there are concrete things in machine learning models that can be asked, right? So, like, what do you, what's the variable that you're optimizing? Um, you know, what, you know, what's the loss that you're putting on it? Um, things like that. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, to the extent people are using machine learning models of standard varieties, like there are answers to those kinds of questions in, mm -hmm. in a fairly concrete sense. Um, and so, you know, they would have to be required to surface that somehow, um, but you could also uh, uh, query that kind of thing by creating okay. dummy users and so on. So I think uh, David in the, in the Q and A asks a question would also sort of provides maybe his own answer to the previous question. He writes, another way to align incentives better is to have people pay for their own media rather than have it advertiser funded. Can you imagine a world moving in that direction such that that becomes a viable solution? Can I imagine that? I, I think it's sort of hard, right? Like some, somehow it sort of seems like that one for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, 
certainly that would help. Um, I think. Yeah, I think, you know, the eyeballs problem being about advertising is, is certainly part of the problem. Right. And the question is, how do we get out of that box? And I, I don't know that anyone has a, a lot of good answers. Certainly, like people could pay for their services, but people don't. Right. Um, they've had yeah. that. Option I, I think I think it's it, some people are. I mean, let, just the two examples that come to mind are the New York Times has more subscribers than they've ever had before. Digital subscribers. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I signed up for Spotify largely because they kept yelling at me to sign up for Spotify. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I pay for I, both of those things, but I don't. Know. I think that's right. Like I'm being a little bit too uh, strident. Certainly, some people do. Um, anyway, I had a, I had one more question, which was back to explainability and adversarial examples. Okay. It sounded like the implication of what you were of what you were uh, uh, saying was that uh, explainability would prevent adversarial examples. Um, and I guess I want to I want to poke at that uh, at that claim a little bit. And I think the, the reason I I, I want to poke at it is because like e even humans are vulnerable to adversarial examples. Like I think about optical illusions, which are designed or like the dress, the blue and black dress, and it was blue and black, I'm sure of it. Um, that was like a naturally occurring adversarial example, right, in some sense. And so, and we're, we're very explainable in some sense. We're, if you could be as explainable as humans, then you've probably done what you were set out to do. So why, why do we, where is that nexus between explainability and sort of immunity to adversarial examples? Yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of why I was sort of harping on the idea of like, well, what constitutes a satisfying explanation? And then, you know, how are we going to measure it? Because um, it's, yeah, you're certainly right. That, you know, human visual system is susceptible to certain kinds of adversarial examples. Um, you know, in, in terms of talking about adversarial examples, I don't know that explainability actually solves that problem a priori, mm -hmm. right? It's, it, it gives you the a posteriori tool to really try to surface, well, why did my model fall? Okay. Maybe, right? Hopefully anyway. Um, or, you know, which of these is, is the model going to fall for and why? So you can audit after the fact, mm -hmm. um, certainly. Uh, stopping it before the fact um, is not really an explainability problem unless you're going to mm -hmm. check every image coming in, which is not feasible or sensible. Um, okay. 